How about that end of one culture and beginning of another? Here we all are. That was a, a wonderful little bit of a segue with Pink Floyd. And uh, I don't know about you, 1970s, I mean, rock and roll music, psychedelic rock. And now we have an amazing talk by an amazing presenter, which is not directly related to uh, Pink Floyd or psychedelic rock, but in the mycelium network, under the ground, everything is connected. And Paul Stamets is a, a leading visionary um, author of two books on uh, mushrooms and uh, medicinal mushrooms, Growing Gourmet Mushrooms and the Mushroom Cultivator. He's been widely recognized as one of the 50 visionaries who are changing the world. That was by the Utney Reader magazine in America. And you may have seen him on the very influential TED Talks, uh, which he's been talking about the, the power of mushrooms for medicine, for bioremediation, for basically you know, utilizing these amazing fungi in ways that can really help heal the world and our own, uh, our own health as well. Um, so without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Mr. Paul Stamets. Big room. Well, greatly honored to be here. It's especially great to be in Australia since my books were banned from this country for many years. That was a badge of honor. I was very happy with that. <laughs> but now they're no longer banned, so maybe there is progress. Um, um, so I come to you um, speaking with the voice of Paul Stamets, but I'm actually uh, a unified colony of microorganisms that are unified speaking with one voice to you, to your colonies of microorganisms, which you are hearing. And what these fungi do, and they're so good at, whether you have been chosen or whether you believe you've been chosen or not, is they use us as vehicles of spreading spore mass. So the fact that my wife and I have come here means that we have spore inoculated the entire audience. And, and in that we are, these colonies of microorganisms, I suggest to you that this gathering, we are creating a new macroorganism. And we could be a new subset of Homo sapiens called Upliftonians. Perhaps we're a new breed of humans that will march into the future. I certainly hope so. So I'm going to present to you in the next hour and a half a suite of, of revelations, solutions that can be put into practice, our story, that of my wife and I, on this long journey through life. And I have a lot of thank yous to give in the course of this. It's just not me. I'm one person along a, a long chain of other mycologists and, and visionaries who've carried the torch to pass it on to the next generation. A Native American elder, I think, put it wonderfully when he said that we did not inherit our environments from our ancestors. We borrow it from our descendants. And I think that there's a lot of truth to that. So before I launch into my, my presentation, a lot of you are probably wondering about this very cool hat that I have. It's my favorite hat. It makes me look really good. Uh, and this hat is actually made from a mushroom called Amadou. You'll be seeing some of the Amadou mushrooms. Amadou was uh, first described in 450 years uh, BC by Hippocrates as an anti-inflammatory. It's one of the most old, oldest known medicinal mushrooms. Amadou is the reason why a lot of us were able to migrate into Africa. There's no doubt that we're Africans at heart. We migrated into Europe several hundred thousand years ago. We discovered something new called winter. Oops. And this mushroom allowed for the portability of fire. You can put fire inside this mushroom and carry it for days, literally. So the fire keepers in, in, in indigenous tribes were, were, had a very practical role that was extremely important for the survival of the clan. If you traveled into the wintertime, you lost the ability of making fire. Of course, your clan could, could freeze to death. And this hat is actually made by some ladies in Transylvania. And through that tradition, through time, this mushroom and this technology of using these mushrooms uh, has survived. Now, I believe that mushrooms, plants, and other substances become shamanistically important because of a confluence of beneficial characteristics. The fact that this mushroom can be used for carrying fire, the fact that it can be boiled in hot water, delaminate into this fabric that can be made for warm for clothing, smeared with animal grease, it becomes very, uh, very waterproof, but 
this hat is highly flammable. So if anyone's smoking a cigarette or a joint near me, I'm always really worried, <laughs> whoosh, my hat will catch on fire and I'll burn up. Um, but this uh, mushroom also revolutionized warfare because even though uh, the Chinese invented gunpowder, the Europeans invented the, the rifle, but this was the major punk that started, that ignited the flint spark that, that then subsequently ignited the gunpowder. So from this mushroom, it gave a highly competitive advantage, not only to indigenous cultures, but also helped, helped in many revolutions in, in our technologies. So this is our great planet that we, we, we abide upon, or we, it's our abode. And I suggest to you that the path into the, into the future for sustainability will be the path of following mycelium. I call this mycelial earth. So I'd like to give gratitude to my mentors. These are the four elders who have greatly influenced my life. And I met these individuals when I was 18 years of age. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Alexander Smith from the University of Michigan, Professor Emeritus, Dr. Daniel Stuntz from the University of Washington, Catherine Skates from uh, Post Falls, Idaho, and then Dr. Michael Bug. These three individuals have passed on, but it's only because of their kindness and generosity that I am here today. And I hold that trust and their respect and my respect for them as something that is extremely valuable to me. It was amazing that they took me under their wing because in the 1970s, uh, it was a very upheaval time. And it was especially amazing because these individuals were what you would call politi politically conservative people. And so when I showed up in their laboratories, this is what I looked like. <laughs> Your suspicions are now confirmed. <laughs> um, so let's go back in time. 7,000 years ago on the Tisilian and Jar Plateau in northern Algeria, on the, on, the, on the edge of the encroachment of the Sahara Desert, there was a labyrinthine cave complex where hundreds and hundreds of cave art uh, pictographs have been found. And uh, these pictographs were renowned to anthropologists and archaeologists, so they went to this area to study them. And they, it was called the Sicilian and Jara Plateau, which means the Plateau of Running Rivers. And they traveled on camelback. La Haute is a, a French anthropologist, Yamaguchi was a Japanese photographer. And they got to this labyrinthine cave complex, and they expected they would find water, and they were shocked. There's there no water to be found. They only had a few days' ration of water, and so they went deeper and deeper into the labyrinthine cave complex. And the story goes that when, you, when you're really thirsty, you can smell water. And, and the deeper you went into the earth, of course, it would be more likely you'd find water. And one of their scouts came and crawled on, a, on his hands and knees through a little tunnel and came to a cavernous chamber and raised his lantern and almost dropped it in fright when he saw this 10-foot uh, bee-like figure, bee-man figure, as it's known as, etched on, on the walls. And in that cavern, they found a spring. So it was a shamanistically powerful spot. And they then photographed it. This is a reiteration by my friend Jonathan Meter. And what's shocking to me is in the four scientific articles that I've read, talking about the bee man, not a single scientist dare would even uh, speculate what the artist's intent was. Clearly, the artist was excited about mushrooms. Because, and this is the unfortunate malaise of our scientific investigations into, into mushrooms. People make fun of them, and the scientists do not want to be made fun of. And so it has now permeated throughout science historically, we call it mycophobia, the irrational fear of fungi and mushrooms. And mycophilia is this the opposite, which I'm infected by. I love mushrooms. Can't you tell? Um, and so... Uh, but I think this is also understandable because the viewscape of our encounters with mushrooms is so temporarily short. We see plants and animals, we engage them for weeks, months, years. Mushrooms come up and then they disappear very, very rapidly. That which can cure you, that which can kill you, that which can you send you into the cosmos on psychedelic trips. For that to be so ephemeral means the learning experience window is so attenuated. So it's, that's not surprising. But what is shocking and surprising to me is a scientific biological racism against mushrooms to be treated seriously. I hope I will dissuade anyone of this argument you know, after this talk. On the border of Italy and Austria, Austria is to the north in the upper part of the slide, Italy is on, on the south, 
there was an amazing discovery in 1991. And the, a, an individual, a Neolithic human, was found in September 1991. And the location was here. It's actually right on the inside of the border of Italy. And this is the border here. And so Austria is here, and here is Italy. And the famous Otzi was found. These are photographs of my friend Reinhard Poter. And Otzi was the best found preserved human remains in a non-funeral setting ever discovered. He died sort of intact, you know, on his adventure through, through the Alps. And he had with him two polypore mushrooms. He had the birch polypore, Piptoporus betulinus, very interesting mushroom, hyperaccumulus betulin, good for the immune system. And he had also with him amadou. This hat is made from amadou, Fomis fomentarius. Now, this fabric you see on the right, that's the actual material the Iceman had in his pouch. Tethered to his right side, these two mushrooms were ready at hand. Now, I carry my knife, my car keys, when I'm right-handed, the things that are most important to you, they're essential that you know where they are at all times, you tether to your right side. And he had these two mushrooms with him because they were so important for his survival. Obviously, they could then be able to create fire, just one spark into that fabric, you blow into it, and it becomes extremely flammable. So that was how important this was in his survival uh, uh, toolkit, as they have these mushrooms uh, uh, clearly close by. Then we advance forward, and I could show you lots of examples. I'm just going to show you two. This is the legend of the origination of the myths uh, of the seasons in, in Greek myth. And this is Demeter giving Persephone a mushroom before she descends into the underworld and denoting the onset of, of, of winter. And she is then into the underworld. She goes to sleep. She's with Hades. And then upon her rebirth is the rebirth of spring. And the Eleusinian Mysteries, some of you have read about this. I highly recommend the Karl Ruck book that goes into this in great detail. So this advances to about 450 BC and then to current times. My wife, Dusty, and I spend a lot of time in the old growth forest. And I give her great thanks because she returned me to the old growth forest after a hiatus. And this is one of our favorite places that we go in the old growth forest in the Northern Olympic uh, uh, National Park of Washington State. Now, there is a thread of a trail there, but what's so interesting to us mycologists is more mushrooms grow along the trail than they, are, than they do in the woods because mushrooms are trail followers. They've learned that animals, including us humans, we can carry spore mass to new environments. So they populate upon debris fields, and mushrooms are extremely good at taking advantage of catas catastrophes, catastrophia. And we are the largest walking catastrophe on this planet. And as a result, mushrooms trail behind us. And then we get spores upon us, and I bring them to you. And here we are. So I want to give you a short biology lesson in the field of mycology. And this is something that really has come into focus by scientists only in the past 20 years. All plants are part fungi. Plants cannot exist without fungi. So here we have a cross-section of an ecosystem. There's a parasitic fungi that obviously kill trees. And then they can grow saprophytically, many of them. And some, most of the saprophytic mushrooms are not parasitic. They just grow on dead material, so they don't, don't harm plants. And then there is a group of the endophytic mushroom species, tremendously important. These give thermotolerance to plants. They can survive up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit temperatures. The endophytic fungi are extremely numerous, 200 to 400 species of endophytic fungi inside of trees, inside the leaves and the stems that grow parallel. Scientists for years were trying to figure out when they cultured plants, why they kept on getting these fungal contaminants. And it took a long time for scientists to realize that those contaminants in the petri dish were not contaminants at all. They were endophytic fungi that were part of the guild that created the host defense colonies of complexity that gave plants the ability to resist disease. And so then we look at the mycorrhizal fungi. These four guilds, the parasitic, the saprophytic, the endophytic, and the mycorrhizal fungi, is what gives these plants the ability to sustain over the long term, to, to survive drought conditions, predators, sudden changes in, in climate, um, et cetera. And so, we know now there's up to 400 to 500 species in play as mutualistic complex complementary colonies surrounding all these plants. Then that's what makes a healthy ecosystem healthy. 
An excellent book I, re- I recommend is Mycorrhizal Symbiosis, and this is one by Smith and Reed. And on the right, you see a root stem, and this is the mycelium actually is wicks up under moist conditions, and that's, for, that's the mycorrhizal fungi wicking up, and it exhales carbon dioxide, inhales oxygen. And this is what we do as well. We are more closely related to fungi than we are to any other kingdom. 650 million years ago, we split from fungi. Our proto-ancestors are fungi. We are the children of fungi. A new super kingdom has been erected in the Journal of Eukaryotic Microbiology in 2006 called Opisthakanta, joining the kingdom of fungi uh, uh, together with animalia, animals. And because of our close evolutionary association, we exhale carbon dioxide, inhale oxygen, and we, and our cells under the microscope, look very, very similar. So immediately upon germination of seeds, they look for a fungal ally. They need a fungal associate to help them protect themselves from diseases. So this is a group of garden seeds that are uh, germinating, all unified with a single mycorrhizal fungus that's sharing nutrients. And the fungi, when they're growing, they do so much. Not only do they expand the root zones, literally by hundreds of thousands of times, but they are also able to interplay within the ecosystem in ways that heretofore were not understood. My, one of my employees is a great skeptic. He doesn't believe that mycorrhizal fungi would help plants. And so we said, oh, great. Then you do the experiments. And so he grew up some California poppies. You can see the difference. With and without mycorrhizal fungi, the mycorrhizal fungi grow, uh, help the plants grow so well. There's a maple trees, and there's also a conifer trees there. The same situation. The seeds uh, were germinated with and without mycorrhizal fungi, and you can see there's a dramatic increase in growth. Dusty and I were very fortunate. Actually, I owe a thank you to George uh, W. Bush. Um, we do, because when he got elected, Dusty and I bought land in Canada. <laughs> um, so... This is some land that we bought in Canada. It's, um, it's, we, have, uh, we planted 37,000 trees, and uh, we, we did 37,000 trees, half of which with mycorrhizal fungi, half of which without. We left the roads there. It was logged because they're ecological div- division zones. Mycorrhizal fungi cannot go through mineral earth. They need the root, uh, roots, and so the roads were ecological barriers separating the treatments. And I'm very happy to say this has been a labor of love. Uh, Jim Gouin and, and David Price and David Summerlin are three of our great allies, and they've been painstakingly putting and measuring uh, 1,100 trees and putting them into Excel spreadsheets over the past seven years. And so for the first time, I'm delighted to show this, we have liftoff. And what you know, it's hard to see this chart, but basically the blue line is showing a, a statistically significant increase in the growth of the trees versus the, the trees that were not treated with mycorrhizal fungi. Statistically significant now. And it's taken us six to seven years and at 10 years. The reason why we are doing this experiment is we could not find a single scientific article where they tested, if your metric is only timber board feet of lumber, which I think is the wrong metric, but let's say that's a metric that you have to fight against with a capitalistic system that's in place, then is it better to leave the wood chips and you know, the debris in the forest, don't burn, let it mulch, and then introduce mycorrhizal fungi? I think we can make that case. Now, the, the ecological metric being so narrowly defined in timber, of, uh, timber feet of, of lumber is obviously a poor metric. But this is the balance in the equations that we have to be up against in order to prove that there is a better way. So we're very delighted that now we are seeing a separation, uh, and we continue this. And you'll notice that the lines are, are, are spreading apart. So we will achieve greater statistical significance over time. Dusty and I, when we go into the old growth forest, it is a sacred, sacred place. And many ecologists didn't fully understand that these forests do so much more. Not only are they the greatest reservoir of above ground storage of carbon on the planet, but they are a pedestal for ecosystems and ecosystem recoveries. They are giant genetic libraries. And in this photograph, you'll see that these hemlock trees, which are here, are underneath these giant old growth trees. And scientists wondered, how is it possible that these hemlock trees could have enough light to photosynthesize? It's really dark in the old-growth forest. And so they took the hemlock trees, they took them into a greenhouse, they gave the same amount of light as in the old-growth forest, they all died. 
They go, well, how are they getting their nutrients? There's a big conundrum, a big mystery. And so scientists then say, well, let's, let's radioactively tag carbon and nitrogen. Arnold Brandt and Samard, 1994, 1996, then published their, their work, which was astonishing and revolutionized our understanding of ecosystems and the role that fungi play. These hemlock trees, you can call them pines if you, if, if you wish, uh, were, they found we're getting nutrients, carbon and nitrogen, hundreds and hundreds of feet away from deciduous trees, from birch and alder trees. They were in the more sunlit areas. And via the mushroom mycelium, the mushroom mycelium had a mothering influence, bidirectionally budgeting nutrients, guaranteeing the plurality and biodiversity of the ecosystem so the ecosystem would benefit as a whole. The loss of these species within the ecosystem can dismantle the ecosystem and take it apart. We have now entered into 6X, the sixth greatest extinction event known in the history of life on this planet. And we are losing more species than we can discover them. And this estimated by Dr. E.O. Wilson from Harvard that we'll lose 50% of the known species in the next 100 years. This is the greatest extinction event ever known in the history of life on this planet. Like rivets on an airplane, how many species will we, we, will we lose before we have catastrophic failure? We're approaching that now. And so under this understanding now of massive ecological collapse throughout the entire world, there's a few of us biologists and scientists and many of the people here who realize it is a time to take action and we need to act extremely quickly. So when the trees climax, they fall and then they begin to decompose. But so many other things are occurring. So basically, in simplistic terms, fungi, take wood or straw or, or grasses, they colonize it, and ultimately soil is being created. Fungi are the great molecular disassemblers of nature, the soil magicians. They build the very lenses of soils upon which we walk. And here is an example of how thin that lens of soil is. In the, in the millions of years of evolution, we exist on such a thin layer of soil Gardeners and farmers knew that, know this. The loss of soil impairs their ability to grow food. The loss of soil around the planet right now is a huge threat to, to our sustainability. In the Pacific Northwest, we can go back 10,000 years to the last ice age. And as the ice glaciers receded, and those of you who have been around glaciers, they're moraine fields, gravel beds, almost no plants. But 10,000 years ago, as, ice, ice, uh, as the glaciers receded, there was uh, uh, small lenses of soil. Uh, just a few feet in diameter, and many of you have seen these little plants come up. Well, the plants would grow, the climax, they would die, they would rot, and then the lens becomes a little bit larger. The tentacles of the mycelium is racing out, foraging for water and bringing in nutrients. More plants would ascend, they climax, they die, they decompose, the lens becomes larger. And yet, in only 10,000 years, we have this much soil that our lives are dependent upon? I think we should pay attention. So the mushroom mycelium is triggered into mushroom formation from four primary environmental stimuli. Obviously, the lots of water helps. So we've had surges of rain, so lots of mushrooms are coming up now. As the mycelium is, is, gets watered, uh, it, leak, it reaches up into the top layers of the soil, and then it inhales oxygen, exhales carbon dioxide. And the mycelium, when it's exposed to water and there's evaporation, there's a drop in temperature. And then there's exposure to light. 99.9% .9 of the mushrooms, I dare say, are photodependent. They will not form in the absence of light. The mycelium will grow, but no mushrooms will form. So these four primary stimuli is, are the ones that trigger mushrooms into mushroom formation. And so the mushrooms then mature very, very quickly. And then here's an example of day 23 on straw. The straw is inedible. Day, day 25, day 27, and up to 20% of that mass of straw becomes an edible food substance, high enough in protein, up to 40% protein that's edible to humans. So these are magical ability to growing food in a very, very short time. But I became fascinated by, well, the mushrooms come up in four or five days, they're gone. But why do they decompose? How do they decompose? So I began to study the decomposition of rotting mushrooms. And this opened up a whole new arena of thinking to me that has been quite 
uh, rewarding and surprising. So here's a mushroom past its prime. It's sporulated. There's lots of spores in the ground around this mushroom. Spores germinate, and the mushroom mycelium forms. And then a few days later, it goes subterranean. There can be more than eight miles of mycelium in a cubic inch. That's how dense and how fine these filaments are. My foot, I estimate, covers 300 miles of mycelium. The mycelium then forms this wonderfully articulated web. I'm going to show you some of my scanning electron micrographs. I was scanning an electron microscopist for many years. And so looking at, under the SEM, looking at the mushroom formation, the mycelium, I was just fascinated. It's a perfectly articulated filtration membrane. And then looking at this and then looking at it closer, I began to really focus in on how, these, how, they are, how organized the mycelial networks were. And the mycelium, when it forms these cavities, they swell with water. So these are like little bladders, little reservoirs of water. And then as the rain stop, and then these little cavities lose their water one at a time. So myceliated environments are spongy environments. They retain water, and they do so much more. The pre-selectivity of the bacterial communities that are surrounding the mycelium are determined by the antibiotical preferences of the mycelium that choose the, the bacteria that are beneficial to the plants that give rise to the plants that create the debris fields that then fall into the forest that feed the mycelium. These are deterministic sequences of decomposition. And so here is the mycelium growing over about 45 minutes. First, there is territorial conquest, and then there is consolidation. This is a photographic movies by my friend Patrick Hickey. And then when Patrick produced this, it was, it was a game changer. These are hyper uh, accumulate, this is hypernucleation. These are bundles of nuclei, hundreds of nuclei per cell that are streaming through the networks of the mycelium. And at the very tips of the mycelium, it's especially hypernuclear. Notice that they don't all go in one direction. 95% of them go in one direction and 5% of them go against the cytoplasm. Now, in a meter diameter uh, uh, mushroom uh, lens, there can be trillions and trillions and trillions of end branchings. Think of them as little scientists all doing experiments. If there is a new insect, a new toxin, a new potential food source, a new adversary, if there's a recombination of genetic material because of epigenesis, and if there is a success of a recombination expression within the genome, and a new antibiotic, a new enzyme, a new strategy for gobbling up that potential new food source, if that occurs, what happens? The mycelium streams forward, is captured more food, and then the information back channels to the entire net. These are self-educating membranes. These are not only externalized lungs, not only do they externally digest their nutrients and bring them in through their cell walls, and the reason why we split from fungi, we went the route of encapsulating our nutrients into a stomach, a cellular sac, digesting our food within. The mycelium chose the path of digesting its nutrients externally. So I propose to you that these are not only externalized lungs, not only externalized stomachs, but these are externalized neurological membranes. And a lot of people accused me in the 1990s when I postulated this, that I was eating too many magic mushrooms. I do not deny that. <laughs> And then the Japanese scientists came out with this great article on a maze uh, where a slime mole was put into the center of a maze. And it's given five different outlets. And then the uh, slime mold is growing through the maze. And then when they gave the, uh, the uh, two oat flakes at two of the five outlets, then the, when they reintroduced, after the slime mold discovered those two oat flakes, when they removed the slime mold and then reintroduced it, it memory mapped the shortest locations uh, necessary to find the food without producing extraneous cell matter, you know, and finding dead ends. So they postulated, well, the slime mold looks like it has a demonstrated cellular intelligence. They also were criticized. But thankfully, another group of Japanese said, well, let's, let's see what happens if we tried to redesign the Japanese subway system with a slime mold. And so this is Tokyo. These are the satellite cities around Tokyo. Uh, and these are basically food uh, points of nutrition. The slime mold is introduced at zero hours, and at five hours it's growing out, 11 hours it's growing out pretty randomly, and at 26 hours it shuts down all the non-essential pathways and reconnects and redesigns the Japanese subway system in a more optimal manner than it is designed today. And then the Japanese scientists said, well, 
how, how, how well did the slime mold design this new subway system? And this is where the mathematicians came in, and they had a startling result. It optimized mathematically. It achieved a 99% perfection of proof in designing a subway system more efficiently than that that any of the human engineers had discovered. So if you have an engineering problem, maybe you want to consult a slime mold. So I'm going to wax poetic here, but this is central to my belief. I believe that the mycelium is aware. It is sentient. And it has a neurological archetype, that which we share as well. These are astrocytes by Hank Morgan, a neurologist. And looking at the mushroom mycelium um, and you're looking at how it's organized, it has cross hatchings. Engineers, uh, computer engineers call these hop points. And for every branch and length going in one direction, there's another branching in another, in another direction. This allows then, if there's a breaking in the mycelial mat, there's an alternative way of transferring information and nutrients. So I postulated with the help of my wife that the mycelium is Earth's natural internet. And the invention of the computer internet came in a time critical where we had to share information when we we're facing these extinction events. And the invention of the computer internet is an inevitable consequence of a previously proven evolutionary successful model. I'm an amateur astronomer, and when I look at the organization of dark matter and dark energy, and this is one example of that, it also conforms to the same mycelial archetype. And then going way out, and this is a deep field view from the Hubble telescope, those are individual galaxies that you see and they're embedded within the cobweb of dark matter. I wonder, are we looking at cosmic consciousness? I believe matter begets life. Life becomes single cells. Single cells become strings. Strings branch, become chains. Chains become membranes. And this is the way. I believe we'll find network-based organisms throughout the cosmos. It's inevitable and they're likely to be fungal in form, and we're likely to find externalized neurological networks throughout all ecosystems and uh, throughout all planets that harbor life. So, the first organisms to come to land were fungi. 1.3 billion years ago, fungi march on the land. Now, fungi do a lot of things, and there's a lot of discussion of water. Many of you may not know that fungi generate water. That's why compost piles sweat, and there's puddles around them. These fungi produce these extracellular metabolites in these little water droplets full of enzymes and acids, and also producing a very interesting group of crystals called oxalic acids. The oxalic acid has an appetite for minerals, and so it pulls calcium out of rocks, iron, manganese, all sorts of other minerals, and forms calcium oxalates, an insoluble salt. And so the, in doing so, it sequesters carbon dioxide, it actually builds the carbon bank within the soil. And then the, car the calcium oxalate crystals, being insoluble, they react to the enzymes and acids of other adjacent organisms. So my work with Battelle Laboratories, we discovered that on osmotic pressure waves, the advancing mycelium will send a cascade of oxalic acid crystals in advance of contact with a potential pathogen, an adversary, food source, whatever. And as the crystals then are destroyed from the enzymatic and acid reactions, then a secondary reaction occurs that alerts the immune system of the mushroom mycelium to produce a customized antibiotic specific to the target of the pathogen in advance of contact. These are messenger crystals. They are thinking outside of the box. And so I would find rocks. I'd tip them over. I'd go, oh, there's mycelium. How cute. Oh, nice. And it took me forever to realize they are not just existing there. They consume rocks. They eat rocks. And this is how plants get their minerals. Fungi eat rocks, and by pockmarking the rocks, pulling out the calcium and iron and other minerals, the rocks become more fragile. They have little hollow points now. They can collect water. It begins the begin, uh, it's the beginning of the creation of soils. So we advanced now to 420 million years ago. This fossil was first discovered in 1859 in Saudi Arabia. 420 million years ago, laying down about a meter tall, this was the tallest organism on land. And it was a big mystery. 
for hundreds of years until Dr. Kevin Boyce in the Journal of Geology published in uh, January of 2007 finally solved the riddle of what prototoxides was. Now, 420 million years, years ago, this is before vascular plants, before flying insects, and there's just kind of creeping crud on the ground. But this organism stood out. And we know that it was not lying down three meters high. It was up to 30 to 40 feet long, dotting across the place, uh, the, the, the surface of the earth, were giant fungal forms. And these were the tallest organisms on earth at the time that electrostatic fields were extremely active, lots of lightning. They would attract lightning strikes. You can draw your own conclusions for that, but what a great uh, uh, habitat for epigenesis and for the creation of new life forms. And so these survived from 420 million years ago to 380 million years ago. Then we advanced the time of uh, Pangaea, when the continents were all connected. 250 million years ago at the PET boundary, the Permian-Triassic boundary, there was a great cataclysmic event, a huge extinction event. More than 95% of the species on the planet became suddenly extinct. There's three competing theories. An asteroid impact is one. Volcanoes in Eurasia, possible. Methane hydrate bursts from the ocean, also possible. I don't see these as mutually exclusive. An asteroid impact could have triggered the earthquakes that caused the fissures of the volcanoes to spew, and the methane hydrate bursts occurred. The earth was covered with dust. Sunlight was choked out, and fungi inherited the earth. Those organisms that paired with fungi tend to survive. And in fact, in the fossil record, they discovered the fungus that gobbled up the forest. It's called Reduvia sporonides. And so this forest gobbling fungus could exist, gobbled up the wood debris over thousands and thousands and thousands of years. The sky is eventually cleared, sunlight returned, and then we ended in the time of Gondwana land, 140 million years ago, and the continents began to separate from continental drift. And so we advance forward, and then 65 million years ago, we have another cataclysmic extinction event. An asteroid impact hits the Earth. It's repeated, huge amounts of debris field jettisoned into the atmosphere, sunlight cut off, and fungi re-inherit the earth. And those organisms that paired with fungi survived. There is a teaching lesson here, folks. We have now entered into 6X, but this extinction event is unique. It is not caused by a methane hydrate burst. It's not caused by an asteroid impact or a volcano. It is the first extinction event that we know that is caused by an organism, us. We are not only will be the victims of this, of this organism, but we are indeed that organism itself. So that asteroid impact occurred in the Yucatan. You all know the story, the dinosaurs became extinct, and we marched forward. In present day, the largest organism in the world is a mycelial mat in eastern Oregon. It's in the John Day wilderness. And I found out about it. It was reported in the literature, the largest contiguous organism in the world. So I hired an airplane and I flew down there. It kills the forest. It's a forest pathogen. It's a honey mushroom, delicious mushroom. Uh, but it kills the forest. So the Forest Service cuts down the trees because of forest fires because they're at the tops of the hills. And so I flew down there. We couldn't find it. And I flew down there again. And, uh, and this time was we, we got the coordinates and on this little tiny airplane. It's a canvas airplane. And, and we went up and up. And, and we couldn't, I couldn't get the whole organism in the photograph. And so I asked the pilot to go higher and higher. And, you know, it's a little prop plane. And so the, the propellers are spinning like crazy and, you know, stressed out. And we get higher and higher. We're up to 14,000, 15,000 feet. And I told the pilot, I think I'm going to faint. And he goes, me too. <laughs> Not a good sign. But I said, well, let me get a photograph first. And so I took this photograph. It's 2,200 acres in size. 1,665 football fields, and it's one cell wall thick. Think of that. There are chains of cells, but it's only one cell wall thick. On the other side of that are hundreds of millions of microbes that are trying to consume it. How is it is it able to achieve that mass? It speaks to the cellular intelligence and the evolutionary strategy of the, these epigenic organized learning cell mats to be able to, to come up with strategies to achieve this mass. And so Jonathan Quinton's going to be talking after me. He inspired me. He gave a fantastic talk. I'm glad he's coming up again. And some of the cultures that we get in the culture uh, follow the golden mean. They form spirals. And then when I found this photograph from the U.S. Forest Service forming a spiral of the honey mushroom in Montana, this struck me 
as being one of the universal truths that we all share. So the mycelium is then triggered into mushroom formation, four different elements, increase in water, in a drop in temperature because of evaporation, uh, inhaling oxygen, exhaling carbon dioxide, exposure to light. And then the, mu the mushrooms, as they begin to form, at the tips of the mycelium, it again becomes hyper uh, hypernucleate, hundreds of nuclei per, per cell, which then segregate just the two nuclei per cell later on. But at the tips, it tends to be very, very rich. And so the primordia begin to form, and they develop very quickly, and for the first time, I'm showing you a time lapse that's successful. Now, one of my nicknames is Stamina Stamets. I will not give up. And I, I'm seriously, 19 out of 20 of my time lapses fail. I kick the tripod, the mushrooms don't behave. I mean, a thousand different reasons. But so I just got this, you know, converted. And I just finished this just before I got on the airplane. And so the first time ever, I'm gonna show you something I'm very proud of. This is Trofaria rugosa annulata, the garden giant. This is a five-day sequence in the development of the fruit bodies from the mycelium. The mycelium can be resident for hundreds of years, literally, and the mushrooms can only form, and they will form within just a few days. Yay! <laughs> so powerful are mushrooms, they can punch through concrete or asphalt. Some of the work I did in the late 1990s with Battelle Laboratories was the decomposition of hydrocarbons, oil in particular, particularly Bunker C oil that's used in the ships. There's an experiment outside of Bellingham, Washington, in the United States, where the Department of Transportation had a bus yard where trucks and buses were stored, and they leaked so much hydrocarbon and oil into the soil, the Department of Ecology said, you have a toxic waste site, you need to clean it up. The Department of Transportation put out a contest. Okay, let's see if there's a remediation strategy because it's so expensive to scoop up all that soil. And so we, we were work, I was working with the Battelle Laboratory, so we put in our application, we were accepted. And there were four piles. One pile is a control pile, one was treated with bacteria by a bacterial remediation company, one was treated with enzymes by a chemical company, and then we came in and we inoculated our pile with oyster and mushroom mycelium. And the oyster mushroom mycelium, we had already demonstrated, absorbs the oil. The mycelium is white and then it becomes black. And the mycelium is producing extracellular enzymes that break down lignin and cellulose that are linked together carbon and hydrogen. And so we discovered that the mycelium breaks down hydrocarbons and then remanufactures them into fungal carbohydrates. So it dismantles them into elemental forms. So when we came back six weeks later, the first pile, dead, dark, and stinky, 20,000 parts per million of PAHs, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And the second pile with enzymes, same story, dead, dark, and stinky, high in hydrocarbons, no chains, the bacteria is the same. And we came to our pile and we removed the tarps and there were gasps of astonishment by the government officials and the scientists when our pile was covered with hundreds and hundreds of giant oyster mushrooms. And some of these are very large, happy mushrooms. So, then the mushrooms then sporulated on top of the oil-saturated soil. And again, because of epigenesis, the influence of the environment on the expression genetically, then the, we can train these strains to have greater aptitude and skill sets for breaking down these hydrocarbon-saturated soils. So our pile, upon a final analysis at 12 weeks, went from 20,000 parts per million to less than 200. Phenomenal success. Approved for freeway landscaping. And then this story really made scientific headlines around the world. But then the mushrooms then sporulated, and then they rotted, and the bacteria started growing. And then something astonishing happened. Is that we, the our pile became an oasis of life. Birds came in after the maggots that the flies had laid eggs into the rotting mushrooms, and maggots grew, and the birds came in. They brought in seeds. And our pile became an oasis of life for the plurality of different plant species. And the three other piles were made dead, dark, and stinky, and lifeless. And then I realized that these primary saprophytes are gateway species that lead downstream to the proliferation of other biological systems. They unlock the door and lower the toxicity levels so other communities of organisms can proliferate. So you can... You can take an, an oyster mushroom kit grown from any company, produces three to five flushes. After that, there's not enough nutrition for it to grow. So you can break it up, take the crankcase oil out of your car, 
pour it on, and boy, more mushrooms will grow. Um, the mushrooms we analyzed had no hydrocarbons whatsoever. But because of the metal tailings and the gears, the mushrooms do hyperaccumulate heavy metals. So we don't recommend that people eat mushrooms around these toxic waste sites. But we found something truly, truly remarkable that's excited people all over the world. Well, we have these unfortunate teaching moments, is what I like to calling them. You know, we have the Exxon Valdez in Alaska, Costco, Busan, and the San Francisco Bay, and the BP oil spill. I had literally hundreds of people write me, Paul, what would you do? What would you do? I've been doing remediation on land. So I thought about it, and I go, well, it's a saline environment. The mushrooms might produce these enzymes. They can break up the hydrocarbons. Let me think about it. And I thought, always challenge authority. Always question the beginning of the decision tree. Because so many mistakes steer us away from logical and exciting discoveries because of this belief that the expert knows more than I do. And so these alpha faculty professors who tell the students, no, don't do that, it doesn't work, they're dangerous. And so I invented mycobooms, hemp socks, full of oyster mushroom mycelium that you can use to corral. And then these hemp socks at first were expensive to produce, you know, through traditional methods. And then I discovered something that I did file a patent on it, I gave up on the patent, and this is revolutionary in its simplicity. It's taken me 30 to 40 years to discover the simplest techniques. And we discovered a salt water fermentation system. We can take straw or wood chips, put it into salt water, let it sit. Salt water is not potable. You can't drink it. It's, it's abundant wherever there's oil spills, typically along coastal lines. There's reed grasses. You can then submerge it in salt water for a week to two weeks. It goes into an anaerobic state. And then we found that we pulled the straw and the wood chips out and laid it on a tarp. Oxygen became the sterilizer against the anaerobes. And then we can inoculate it with mushroom mycelium and it grows beautifully. This is such a simple revolutionary method. Not only can it mitigate the effects of oil spills, but can help feed people in communities around the world. The mushrooms are saline to tolerant. I called Seth, uh, some of the mycologists said, well, oyster mushrooms tolerate uh, uh, salt water. They said, of course not. I said, well, did you try? He goes, no, but it's obvious. I go, well, I'm an idiot. It's not obvious to me. Let me try. So this is a method you'll hear a lot more in the ensuing months. We have now chosen these containers. They're universal around the, the fruit and seafood industry. So we've been able to come up with a mechanizable system that we can expand throughout the entire world. And we had Chernobyl, another teaching moment. And Chernobyl... What was so interesting, the Ukrainian scientists in a downwind environment started analyzing the foods that the Ukrainian people were consuming, so concerned about radioactive fallout. And they found something astonishing. There was a mushroom that stood out that hyperaccumulated cesium-137 more so than any other plant in the ecosystem by orders of magnitude. And it is gomphidius glutinosus, called the hideous gomphidius. It's a mycorrhizal mushroom. This mushroom becomes highly radioactive, concentrating cesium-137 10,000 times the background levels of the environment, and in doing so, decontaminates a large expanse of land. The mushrooms become radioactive, but then it lowers the toxic threshold levels, allowing the plurality and diversity in the proliferation of biological systems to recover. Why would a mushroom do that? We may not know why, but it speaks to the importance of mycodiversity, the diversity of these fungi. So then after Fukushima, I had all these people write me, Paul, what would you do? And so I immediately wrote, within a week of Fukushima, the Nuclear Force Recovery Zone. This has been translated into Japanese. It was presented in front of the Japanese uh, legislature. We have now formed a top-notch group of scientists who are on the cutting edge. We have looked at all the other remediation strategies, and I propose that we, we create an old-growth forest around Fukushima. And then so we sequentially, over the generations, pick these mushrooms that hyperaccumulate cesium-137, and by doing so, to gradually detoxify the environment. There's no other alternative. There's more than 600 truckloads of soil being taken to toxic waste dumps that they're creating the size of 50 football fields. They're bringing in millions of gallons of water per day into Fukushima right now, which becomes radioactive that they cannot discharge. I know too much about Fukushima. It's an oncurring disaster. There is exposure a uh, hundred times that of the tolerable limits more than a hundred miles away from Fukushima. The population is immunologically depressed because the environment is becoming compoundedly more toxic. 
So, but from the Fukushima, and more so from Chernobyl, a group of scientists from Einstein University were looking at remote cameras and more than a million rads of radioactivity inside of Chernobyl. And they saw black molds growing on the, on the cement walls. There's no nutrition. How could these molds be growing? They went and they analyzed the molds and they found something heretofore unprecedented in this field of science. That under a million rads of radioactivity, these fungi flourished on concrete. And they discovered a new part of the life cycle of melanizing fungi, fungi that have the same pigments that we have that the melanizing fungi can use gamma irradiation in a fashion similar and analogous to the way that plants use sunlight for cellular metabolism. Now, I was involved with Saifu Camp as a Googleplex from a, a TED spinoff. I met the head of the Martian landing mission. He says, it's, you know, six months to get to Mars, you know, one year on the planet, six months to get back, but the biggest problem is food. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, I want to tow greenhouses. And I said, in the vacuum of space? You know, that greenhouse, how are you going to insulate them? You know, I said, it's a huge problem. This discovery here may allow for the interplanetary colonization of space by growing fungal foods like tempeh. And moreover, we can have genomic libraries that can be within the space shuttles. And as we go to these other planets, we can begin to terraform. We can terraform the planets using the gamma radiation you know, in the cosmos as well as the nuclear engines on the spaceships and then begin to create the lenses that I described earlier post the glacial period to create biospheres on other planets. So these accidents, as terrible as they are, can be teaching lessons. I really need to move fast now, folks. This is where Dusty and I live. We live on Skookum Inlet in Washington State. Four salmon runs a year, steelhead, you know, cutthroat trout, beautiful place. And actually, this photograph is important for me to tell you. I hired an airplane, and I flew around three times, and the window was always in the way for my photograph. So I told the pilot, go around one more time. I'm going to do something. Don't be concerned. He goes, what are you going to do? And I go, I paid you. And he goes, yeah, you paid me. I said, no, don't worry about it. Just do what I say. When I say, drop the wing. So he went around and ran around, and I said, drop the wing. You know, and he dropped the wing. And so I opened up the door. I knew he wouldn't say I couldn't you know, open up the door. And so I took off my seatbelt. What I didn't know is that it was a slip-locked seatbelt. I opened up the door of the airplane. I'm still going 120 miles an hour on a steep bank. And I fell out of the airplane. And I had one leg in the airplane. And I had wrapped the seatbelt like this. And I'm upside down. I thought, well, I'm here. I might as well take a photograph. Boom. <laughs> so so this, is where, this is where Dusty and I live, right here on Skookum Inlet. And right after I moved in in 1984, a week later, the sheriff shows up with a summons. I thought, well, that was awfully quick. <laughs> I didn't have a chance to do anything illegal yet. <laughs> But every owner on this inlet was given a summons saying you had to replace your septic system within two years. It would be physically forced off your property. I bought a small farm, those small cows, chickens, and pigs. They more than double the next year. And so I couldn't afford to put in a $25,000 septic system, but I did something different. I put in wood chips, and I inoculated with that mushroom, the garden giant mushroom, the King Stropharia. A year later... I had another fleet of uh, government officials show up in my driveway. They said, we've been monitoring the water coming off your property. And what did you do? You didn't play replace your septic, system, your septic system, did you? And I go, no. And I had more cows, more bio burden. I said, well, I put in these wood chips, and I inoculated with a mushroom mycelium of a mushroom that has an appetite for bacteria. That was the dawning of mycofiltration. I had a 100 to 1 reduction of bacteria, E. coli, coming off our property by using sheet mulches of mushroom mycelium. So the mushroom mycelium grows, it grows, it permeates the wood, it's very tenacious, it can hold more than 30,000 times its mass in a strand of mycelium. And the mycelium then can produce these bodacious mushrooms, which are then become full of maggots that can feed fish and salmon and trout. And so that was the dawning of the mycofiltration. And the mycelium then, and we tried to convince, uh, you know, that, that this could really help water quality around Mason County, Washington, where the shellfish industry and the seafood industry is so important. But there's no money. So Dusty and I uh, pro bono uh, 14 locations, and uh, our employees and ourselves went out, and we started putting in oyster mushrooms in burlap sacks around, uh, around streams that were choke points that were channeling E. coli from farms and parking lots and elsewhere, septic systems. So this is from the Mason County. That the water is moving like this fast. The water is moving fairly quickly. Water does not discriminate between petroleum products and E. coli, so there's an obvious message here. And so directly afterwards, we did measurements here, measurements down here, 
And there was, a, generally speaking, a 10 to 1 reduction in fecal coliform E. coli bacteria. Fantastic success. And so then we got involved with the conservation districts of the United States. We made engineering diagrams. We produced a manual on this. It was free for anybody. And then we started, um, I, and then I had this epiphany that gourmet and medicinal mushroom farms should be localized around every major community and reinvented as healing arts centers. I really believe this is important. And I am institutes of applied mycology. This is what I want to dedicate my life to, to create throughout the entire world institutes of applied mycology reinvented as healing arts centers to help the immunological system of this planet. We share our immune systems with our environment via the mycelial bridges, the cellular bridges that join us together, but there's so much more. The extracellular metabolites contain within them other compounds. And within these compounds can be antibacterial and antiviral agents, besides the enzymes that break down oil and other uh, contaminants. So <laughs> I married the most wonderful woman in the world. It's true, folks. Be jealous. It's true. And I, I said, well, we have to go to an FDA-approved laboratory to measure whether these strains we have are truly uh, fighting bacteria. And so I submitted 10 strains to a laboratory and then I got the results back, and I got the bill, $25,000 bill. I went, oh, no, i got to tell Dusty. She was in charge of accounting and things. And I got, honey, we have a problem. And I said, uh, I did the research. I sent in the, the results. I got the results back. Here's the invoice, $25,000. And she goes, well, did we get good results? And I went, oh, yes. <laughs> That's good. We did. And there's a logarithmic scale. It's pretty simple to understand. 10 to the first power is 10 CFUs, colony-forming units. 10 little bacteria in a, in a gram of water, a milliliter of water. 10 to the third power is 1,000 bacteria in a milliliter of water. 10 to the sixth power is, is, is a million. 10 to the eighth power is more than 100 million. So with E. coli and MRSA, Staphylococcus aureus, in 24 to 48 hours, three of our mushrooms dropped the colony counts of viable colonies of E. coli and staph from more than 100 million to less than 10,000 to 100 in 24 to 48 hours. Tremendous success. So we knew that agaricon, this is a mushroom that I've been fascinated about for all my life. My dear professor, Dr. Michael Bug, found his first agaricon this past fall after hunting agaricon in the old growth forest for 40 years. And so we have been exploring and trying to find this mushroom. It's extremely hard to find. And so it had a reputation back in the time of Dioscorides in 65 AD as a treatment against consumption, later didn't be known as tuberculosis. So we tested these mushrooms, and in fact, they were active against tuberculosis. And this is the oldest living mushroom in the world. It lives for up to 100 years in age. It has this amazing transformation of forms. It can take on the Venus of Willendorf form. When it dies, it looks like the backside of a healthy-looking lady to me. It can look like a foot. It can take on the Ganesh form. You know, this thing is incredibly mutable. Um, and so National Geographic gave me the Green Ovator Award. Still don't know what that means. But they wanted a story on me. And they wanted to come out in January. And I said, you're from New York. You don't understand. You can't come out in the old growth forest in January. It's too much snow, 20 feet. You know, can't get up there. So I said, come out in July. And so we rented the uh, uh, as motor sailor in British Columbia. And we went up the inlet passage, Desolation Sound. And, and, and he said, well, how likely is it we'll find a Garricon? I mean, it took me 20 years before I found my first one. I said, oh, 50-50? He goes, you know, I'm on a schedule. I'm writing an article. I need to make sure we find a Garricon. I go, well, I wasn't going to tell him it was one in a thousand chances we'd find it. So I said, sure, we'll find it. And I had good reasons to say that because I t we took 10 of our friends, and they had high-powered high binoculars. And a Garricon only grows on old-growth trees, usually with bald eagles on top. They're usually living snags. They're broken from lightning strikes and whatever. And the agaricon looks like a big beehive. So I figured about well, 10 friends on a motor sailor will go and try to find the agaricon. So we motored and we motored and we couldn't find it, couldn't find it, couldn't find it. It was getting a very long day. And we had a retina burn. Five seconds on a tree, five seconds on a tree, five seconds on a tree. You know, you do that thousands of times, like your brain is just like, okay, enough. So our skipper said, well, let's go over to a Native American first people indigenous site that we don't know what the what the pictographs mean anymore, but it's a very interesting place. So we motored over there, and oh my God, we couldn't believe what we found. And this tree here 
we found an agarikon. And it fell from the upper branch from a storm or something, dropped onto that lower branch, teeter-tottered on it, the mycelium grew back into the tree, and then it grew, grew two legs. You know, so it's a phenomenal. So, oh, the National Geographic guy's excited. Everyone's excited. Scott Franzblau, the top tuberculosis researcher in the United States, came with us. Here is Scott. He's one of the pictographs. And for, unfortunately, for the lack of time, I can't go into the origination myth of women with a haida. But Gujal, our respects to Gujal, is the chief shaman of the haida people. were decimated by smallpox, and they carve plates speaking to the origination myth of women and Agaricon was in the canoe that paddled the sea of eternity to discover genitalia. So Agaricon is very important to the Haida, but Gujal said two smallpox pandemics, two flu pandemics, we lost our ancestral knowledge, Paul. So Dustin and I feel it's our mission to return Agaricon to the Haida. So we were there, and this is an overhang of about 30 feet and you're out of, the, out of the wind, you're out of the rain, you're right on a really rich salmon-bearing area, shamanistically, uh, this is a power spot because of a confluence of advantages, and had a garricon growing around there, and the, the first peoples who were suffering from tuberculosis as well as pox and flu viruses. So we were there, and then um, we're, you know, it took me a long time, and then we see this rock. We're looking at this rock going, wow, look, how weird, look at this rock. Now here's a rock, here's a garricon, here's a rock, here's a garricon, Here's the rock. Here's the garricon. Do you get the picture here? So we're like, okay, how likely is it we would find a garricon? I don't know, one in a hundred maybe. How likely is it we find a, a garricon on a shamanistic place that speaks to a, has a pictograph that speaks to the origination of, of women in the Haida myth? I don't know, one in a thousand. How, how likely that we would find a garricon, you know, uh, in a place that had a rock that looked like the shape of an agaricon, like it was carved? I don't know, one in a million. How likely is it we would find it on my birthday? <laughs> and this is when the National Geographic photographer t- turned sort of trembling and shaking uh, and looked at one of our friends and says, does this happen to Paul and Dusty often? And my friend looked at him straight in the eye and said, yes. And I think this speaks to a greater scientific truth. If you're true to your heart, you respect first peoples. You respect and you want to preserve biodiversity. You can call it what you will. You can call it God. You can call it Gaia. But nature will reward those people who respect nature. Mm. Here's a, a dead tree, a snag. And to give you an idea, there is a 700-year-old Douglas fir tree in Canada. And we hired our, our friend, Scott Baker, who's a tree canopy expert. He shot his little guideline with his hacky sack, slingshot, and up Scott goes. A hundred feet up into the largest, to, to, to what we believe is the largest agaricon, the oldest one in the world so far, is about a hundred years in, in age. This is an ancestor and elder. We dare not pick it. We don't pick these anymore. If we find them on the ground, we'll pick them up. And so this is the one that is growing, and it's not rotting the branch that it supports it. In fact, this branch becomes calcified, probably calcium oxalate. And so the branch becomes like petrified. And so it should, because otherwise it would drop, drop the conch that's growing through it. So then we were able to get this into culture. And now, through the grace of God and Gaia, we have the largest library of agaricon in, in the world. 45 strains of agaricon we have in culture. We are dedicating our lives to have at least 100 strains to to preserve the biodiversity of this sacred and rare species that grows exclusively in the old growth forest, now thought to be extinct across large regions of Europe, few sky islands that that exist, but we have this great genetic uh, resource in the Pacific Northwest of the old growth forest. So we use a little stainless steel probe. We leave the agaricon there. That's all the amount of tissue that we need. And this is so much of my life. I do lots of tissue culture. We have very large laboratories. We produce 20,000 kilos of mycelium per week, six large laboratories. And then this is four agaricon strains. I did a challenge test to see if they're the same strain. If the same strain is called same self-recognition, they fuse together seamlessly. If they're a different strain, you'll see these ridges. So we determine on a small island, there's lots of biodiversity of agaricon. So then this is exciting to us because these exocellular metabolites not only contain antibacterial compounds that you saw against Staphylococcus and against E. coli, 
But directly after 9-11, the BioShield program got a hold of me because they knew of our library, the U.S. government heard of our library of old ancient strains from the old growth forest. And the biggest concern after 9-11 by far was bioterrorism, smallpox in particular. And so we submitted so far 700 samples, the BioShield program is over with now. We submitted our first 150 samples and then we received the results back. Dr. Earl Kern is a virologist with the BioShield U.S. Defense AMRID NIH program. And if a compound has a selectivity index of uh, two or more is active, 10 or more is highly active. More than 2 million samples were submitted to the BioShield program. We submitted a total of 500. The first 120 samples, we hit the big home run. And you can hear an interview with myself on National Public Radio, a director of the BioShield program, and the deputy director of the FDA on Agaricon, authenticating what I'm telling you is true. Of the more than 2 million samples that are submitted to the BioShield program, we had the best activity against smallpox, variola viruses, and other orthopoxes of anything submitted. What the BioShield program allowed us to do is they wanted known active molecules to be submitted drugs. We submitted a natural product. We kind of got under the radar, thankfully. And I had had people from the U.S. Defense Department call me up at home saying, we are so behind you. And so we were able to make these discoveries. But then the big virus of concern by far is bird flu. So here is a synopsis of literally millions of dollars worth of research. Agaricon is called Fomitopsis fishnalis, red reishi, then chaga, and a three-species blend. There's the virus, there's ribavirin, in the positive control, pure pharmaceutical. We submitted our extracts in ethanol, 35%, diluted then to 3.5, diluted again to 0.35, 100 to 1 dilution to get rid of the alcohol. And so 100 to 1 dilution of our extracts were given, and these are our results. Phenomenally active against bird flu. More than 10 times that of the positive control. No toxic effect whatsoever in the, in the in vitro cell cultures using human cells. And so we were able then to make the claim and the statement to the U.S. government and to the world that we should therefore save the old growth forests as a matter of international defense. <laughs> We are facing a period of viral storms. Fukushima was a perfect storm. A tsunami, an earthquake, a tsunami, a nuclear disaster, dead people, chickens, and pigs, all co-mingling in a giant petri dish of salt water. The survivors are immunologically compromised. They're sick. I was following three different bird flu outbreaks of wild birds on the east coast of Japan before the earthquake. I am so surprised we did not get a pandemic coming out of that event. But this is from two days ago, Google flu trends. That dark blue line is the current flu trends. We have entered into a period of viral storms. I predict there will be a chart like this in the future that will be 10 times as great. If we have the communicability of H1N1, H1N1 but the lethality of H5N1, then we will be suffering a calamity heretofore unseen in the history of humankind on this planet as ecosystems become distressed. Okay, I'm going to switch now, and I really need to move forward because I'm going to really tie some big loops here. Ants discovered that if you paired with fungi 25 million years ago, you would have a host defensive resistance against pathogens. This is an ant mound, thatch ant mound, Washington State. There is a big lepiota mushroom. Here is the scientific article that shows this is true. And by doing so, the ants would honeycomb their colony with mycelium and it would prevent pathogens from then attacking the ant nest. My trusting wife, I said, let's do an experiment. We'll grow up the honey mushroom mycelium. I'll be the photographer. You hold the shovel. Somebody else will throw the mycelium in. She goes, well, what do you want me to do? And I said, destroy the ant nest. She goes, they'll attack me. I go, I know. It's for science. <laughs> and so, so one, two, three, she did that. We inoculated the mycelium into the ant nest. A horrific uh, response, as you can imagine. And as soon as the mycelium got into the nest, they retreated. And they colonized. They, used, they recognized the mycelium as being a recognized beneficial fungus. They rebuilt the nest. And the next year, we had giant lepiota mushrooms, edible in choice for my grandson there. And then the next year, we had more. 
And then here is day, here's one day, the next day, the next day, and then Paul has a beer and reads, he reads the New York Times. And then they get very, very big. Parasol mushrooms is one of the common names. And so we have hundreds of these come up in the fall. The ants are happy, we're happy. And, uh, and so they spread and they do all the work for us, all from one inoculation. So what people don't realize is almost all insects are parasitized by a group of fungi called entomopathogenic fungi, fungi that kill insects, entomopathogens. And the biopesticide industry tried to flourish for the 70s, in the 1970s and 80s and 90s and failed miserably in trying to use these fungi to control termites and carpenter ants and other insects. But the insects aren't stupid. Even though you could cover these in a petri, in a petri dish in a laboratory with the spores of this fungus and it would kill the termites, uh, you, if you can't get to the queen, you're just killing workers, and the queen produces hundreds of these per week, if not thousands. And so the biopesticide industry never launched because of the repellency property of the spores. The insects are constantly cleaning themselves as they walk. You've seen this in all the movies. They're cleaning themselves because of this fungus called metarhizium. And so they're constantly smell it. They know it's a, a pathogen. And so, uh, so intense is the smell that at termite nests, there are guards. And if a single worker comes back with any spores of this fungus, the guards will grab that worker, take it to a graveyard, cut off its head, and the two guards commit suicide. Because now they're in the graveyard. And two new guards set up station looking for any other inside workers coming in with this fungus. That's how sensitive they are. And so the queen, so they protect the queen at all costs. So the industry failed because of the repellency property of spores. Well, I ordered some of these because our house is being destroyed by carpenter ants. And the carpenter ants were destroying our house and Dusty moved up from California and I was like so worried she was going to move out. We had this house with a flat roof in Washington, 14 buckets catching water coming from the roofs. So that cats were on the roof. You can draw those two conclusions. It was really, really bad. Andy Wild described it as the worst house he's ever been in North America. And, um, and I said, I'm not going to use pesticides, you know, but I, I got this fungus and I, and I grew it out and then I saw these two little wedges here. And these wedges, I'm going, what's that? I look up in the scientific literature. All the scientists said, avoid those wedges. Non-sporulation. Strain is dying. You're uh, unable to reproduce. And I said, well, I'm going to go a different way. And so I would morph the strain in culture. This really doesn't happen in nature because, because the mycelium quickly dies out. It can't reproduce. So I'm pushing the, the, the edge of ev evolution several thousand years, millions of years into the future. And I go from a sporulating culture to a non-sporulating culture. And so then I made a big game with my wife and my daughter. Now, I owe a big thank you to my mother. My, I grew up in a very difficult environment, but I had a strange skill set of being able to fix vacuum cleaners. So I'm a really good house husband in that I vacuum and I wash a lot of dishes. I love washing dishes. And, uh, and so I would, always, I would go to this one place in our house and uh, I'd be vacuuming up these little piles of sawdust. Every single morning there was a carpenter ants would be destroying our house, leaving a big pile of sawdust and I'd vacuum, have my espresso vacuum, have my espresso vacuum hundreds and hundreds of times. And I realized I gotta do something, my house is being destroyed. And so I go up to mycelium in the non sporulating stage as you see here. And then I put out the little doll dish and my daughter comes running in and at uh, two o'clock in the morning said, dad, Dusty, wake up, you gotta see this. We walked, we got out of bed, walked over there, and we saw the ants take these little rice kernels, cover the mycelium, and go back into the house. One week later, no sawdust piles. Now, if my daughter didn't wake up, my, we had mice in the house. The mice could have eaten the rice, but we saw it with our eyes. And so we started doing more, more experiments, and we hit the huge home run in creating mycoattractants. These mycoattractants are incredibly important. And here, the ants then, and the termites take it past the guards. They give it to the queen. The queen spreads it throughout the nest. Now realize that fungi need to eat too. We eat plants, poor plants. Oh, don't eat me. Wow, humans eat us. We're vegetarians. No, you're not. You know, it depends on your perspective. So, um, so my aunt Louise calls me up, says, Paul, you got rid of the carpenter ants in your house, but the family farmhouse, you know, needs you. And I go, I'm not licensed by the EPA. And they said, well, you know, can you please do it? And I said, oh, there's an exemption for scientists in their own houses, so i kind of in the family. Okay, I'll try. And I did it at my Aunt Louise's house, and she left me this message. This is Louise calling at noon on Wednesday. I'm very excited to tell you that the ants are all gone. I came down Sunday morning, and on the rug below the toilet was a huge circle of black ants, and they were all acting very strange, and they weren't running anywhere, and among the ants was a very large black ant that 
and I figured it must have been the queen. So I thought, oh, what do I do? So I picked the carpet up and shook all those ants into the toilet and flushed it. And now they're gone. And I've only seen one other ant that was incapacitated and he was kind of going crazy trying to walk out on the front porch. So I stepped on him and finished him. <laughs> but I have not seen any ants anywhere out on this cement deck. So my, my, uh, my Aunt Louise is very happy. We did not have to use pesticides. We were able to do that. And then the house then sporulates and produces repellency. So the ants have not reinvaded in seven or eight years, never reinvaded our house. So we found something that epizoically we can, can treat a single house. And so this, this story, and then bizarre, a cordyceps mushroom, boing, springs out of the head and the anus of the ants. And so it's a dimorphic fungus. It's got a cordyceps state and a mold state. Okay, I need to really get through this. So, cordyceps is the most medicinally important fungus found so far. It is responsible for cyclosporin, for immunologically depressing uh, individuals receiving organ transplants, as Bruce was talking. Uh, Self recognition then is, is, is inhibited. And Jelenia is a new drug for multiple scler uh, sclerosis that uh, no, uh, Novartis uh, claims will be the sixth most uh, profitable drug invented in the history of medicine comes from these, these fungi. So we developed bait stations, and then we did extracts, and we can steer the termites, four choices. One, ta one uh, on the left there has the treatment of the pre-sporulating mycelium extracted in water and alcohol, and we can cause insects to go specifically. They are super mycoattractants when you defeat sporulation. And then we tried it, well, I tried it against social insects, you know, ants and termites. I'll try it against fungus gnats. And then I said, when I met Bill Gates, I said, you know, Bill, you want to control malaria. What if I got all the mosquitoes to come on one location? And he goes, yeah, that would be helpful. So we tried against mosquito compared to a human arm. And we're roughly equivalent to that of a human arm attracting mosquitoes that can then uh, be attracted to the extracts. I can see fogging systems where they, in Florida and elsewhere in California, they use to prevent freezing of the orchards. We can fog these mycoattractants. My dream is to bring a locust plague into a 55-gallon drum. I think I can do that. So important is this discovery. Hundreds of other scientists worked on this for 20 or 30 years. They all missed it. They all missed it. And I'm blessed and thankful that I'm the one that discovered this. And I received my first patent against carpenter ants, termites, fire ants. And then I received four more patents. And the U.S. Patent Office last year realized, since I did it with so many different insects, that I had some, found something paradigm shifting. And they gave me all insects without restriction, the species, with all entomopathic genic, uh, pathogenic fungi. This is a huge, huge breakthrough. And in my book, The Mycelium Running, I have the five stand, uh, uh, guiding principles that protect these patents. Number one, we wage no war against nature. We want to protect insects, but no termites in my house, please. Number two, these patents cannot be blessed and, and, and quashed. I met with every major pesticide company in the world, with the exception of Monsanto. I refused to meet with them. And people are a little, little uneasy about this, because you have these patents, Paul. Well, a patent is not useful unless you get it to market. I have not been able to get it to market. It'll take me about $10 million to get it to market. But then I also received a patent for all insects, all entomopathogenic fungi, in Australia. And it is my blessing today that Dusty and I are giving the Australian people this patent, carte blanche, no restrictions. It is now for all of you to practice without restriction. But now, you have the responsibility. You have the responsibility to make this work. The test of a patent is that it's reproducible. Okay, I need to scream forward. I, have a, I asked for an extra five minutes. I'm down, down to the wire here. So how does this tie in? Insects and arthropods vector zoonotic pathogens. Ants carry staph bacteria. Mosquitoes carry malaria, dengue, dengue fe fever, yellow fever. Hey, if there's a bird flu pandemic, don't swat that house fly. You'll aspirate the bird flu throughout your entire house. Did you know that house flies carry bird flu? 
Bed bugs carry MRSA. We have great results against bed bugs, lice and ticks, fleas, midges. What can we do? We can control disease vectors coming from ecosystems by inhibiting the pathogens that the insects are carrying, by mixing in expired drugs or the precursor drugs used to make antiviral, antibacterial uh, medicines that are not uh, clean enough for human use, which are expired, which are, uh, and we can mix these with our mycoattractants to lower the pathogen payload, steering insect populations across the ecosystems. This group of fungi do not harm bees. They do attack the varroa mites. And so the idea of using these as to be able to attract uh, varroa mites away from beehives and being able to mitigate them, that is also a very good idea. So not only do these insects vector viruses, but there are viruses that cause cancer. They're called oncoviruses. This has become another speciality of mine. We know of six or seven viruses that cause cancer. HPV, we know, all know about that, you know, for cervical cancer. Uh, hepatitis C for liver cancer, and other cancers. Merkel cell carcinoma, we know about that. Did you know that 73% of all anti-cancer drugs are sourced from nature, still? The pharmaceutical industry does not want you to know this. So we were funded by NIH for a $2.1 million breast cancer clinical study, phase one study, which has now been completed. And yesterday on the news throughout Seattle, the phase two and phase three studies were announced by the FDA and NIH based on the positive results in this first study, which used our mushroom mycelium of turkey tails, which grows everywhere here, whatever there's wood. And so prior to radiation therapy for stage two, stage three, non-ER, non-estrogen responsive breast cancer, but then the ER responsive were also brought into the group. Then prior to radiation, there's a, with three grams of turkey tail mycelium versus six, there's a dose dependent increase in your natural killer cells. Um, and the red is no treatment at all. Directly after radiation, you're immunologically compromised, you're depressed, your immune system's been damaged as well from the radiation. And then uh, two weeks later, on a dose-dependent basis, the immune system expands, and then it expands even more. And so in four weeks, there's a tremendous fortitude of your immune system. We all have cancer all the time. Nature is a numbers game. Cancer is a numbers game. How many coefficients can you get on your side of the equation that will result and you're surviving cancer. This is the, the, uh, the, the, the race against disease. So we achieve statistical significance. For those of you who are in significance, look at that significance. It's actually 0 .0003, hugely significant. Now, Fred Hutch Cancer Center, because of Merkel cell carcinoma, I don't have time to go through this, but we have some best case studies that's just been published in a medical journal. Only uh, two of the 10 surviving patients from Merkel cell carcinoma in the world we're taking our mycelium. They've been written up in medical journals now. And Dr. Paul Nim, I call it the Nim hypothesis, is that the cancer is cloaked from the immune system. Your immune system's active. You're producing the natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells, but they can't lock and load. They can't find binding sites on the receptors of the stroma, the skin of the tumors. And so the tumors evade the immune system detection. With these mushrooms as an adjunct, the immune system is alerted and is able to invade the tumors. So the, on the right, there's immune invasion of natural killer cells and cytotoxic T cells that are able to go past the stroma, locate the tumors, and then break them apart. Now, this became especially personal to me in June of 2009, when my mother, who's a very religious woman, who has not seen a doctor since 1968, calls me up on the phone and says, Paul, I have something very important to talk to you about, but you're always so busy. I go, oh no. I said, what's wrong? My mother's a very cheery woman. And she goes, she started crying. And she says, Paul, my right breast is five times the size of my left. I have six angry lymph nodes on my right side. They're big and black and swollen. And her voice was shaking. I'm scared. And I said, why didn't you tell me? And she goes, well, a Christian scientists came through with a Namarsky tele a microscope and said, you don't have cancer. I go, oh no. I spent most of June at cancer hospitals in Seattle. The second visit, we got the worst news. My mother was given less than three months to live. The tumor was beginning to erupt, you know, through her breast. It metastasized, crossed the meridian, invaded her bones, her sternum, went to her liver. And we had a circle meeting and my mother said, I'm dying. And you're not going to buy an expensive casket. I bought a casket, the cheapest one we can find. I'm going to Jesus. 
So don't, you know, I already bought the casket. So we had the circle meeting and lots of tears. And then on the second or third visit, the doctor said, you know, you're too old for a mastectomy. You can't have radiation therapy. Ma'am, a lot of women have their lives stolen from them in their 40s and 50s with the same cancer. You're 84. You've lived a long life. You should be happy. But you should prepare for the end now. There's nothing that we can do for you. They put her on Taxol briefly. She had an adverse reaction. They put her on Herceptin. And then the doctor said, you know, but there's this interesting breast cancer clinical study going on with turkey tail mushrooms. You might want to try those too. And that's when my mother said, well, my son's supplying those. You know, so she kind of had to hear from a doctor. So my mother started taking turkey tail mushrooms capsules, eight per day in combination with her septin. And six months later, and to this day, she has no detectable tumors whatsoever. Mycelium represents rebirth, rejuvenation, regeneration. Fungi generate soil that gives life. The task that we face today is to understand the language of nature. My mission is to discover the language of nature of the fungal networks that communicate with the ecosystem. And I believe nature is intelligent. The fact that we lack the language skills to communicate with nature does not impugn the concept that nature is intelligent. It speaks to our inadequacy for communication. If we don't get our act together and come in commonality and understanding with the organisms that sustain us today, not only will we destroy those organisms, but we will destroy ourselves. We need to have a paradigm shift in our consciousness. What will it take to achieve that? If I die trying, and but I'm inadequate to the task to make a course change in the evolution of life on this planet, okay, I tried. The fact is, I tried. How many people are not trying? If you knew that every breath you took could save hundreds of lives into the future, had you walked down this path of knowledge, wouldn't you run down that path of knowledge as fast as you could? I believe nature is a force of good. Good is not only a concept, it is a spirit. And so hopefully the spirit of goodness will survive. Thank you. Thank you, Bharat. Thank you, Bhavani. Thank you, Ehab. Thank you, Aura. Thank you, Dusty. Thank you all. Look at that. It, it, wow, take a bow. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Samets. Such passion and such intelligence. We're very, very privileged to have him here speaking at Uplift Festival today. So thank you yet again, Paul. Uh, next up, we have the, uh, the power of sacred geometry. We have an amazing visionary uh, multimedia artist, Jonathan Quinton, 
who will be giving us a 15-minute primer in sacred geometry, what it is, what the mathematical principles underlying it are, how we can apply that uh, in our field of knowledge, and uh, let's see, let's see the, the sacredness and, and, and mathematics of geometry. Jonathan's just setting up now. Let me read you a bit here. Um, TS123. He's all right. He's oh. all right. Um, this isn't going through yet. 